We finish everything. Okay. Okay. I've been questioning that. Pagination. Yep. So I don't think I have pagination yet. Do I have pagination? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, recap on what's the state of the code. Yeah, have you started on your CA2? Minus those who already advanced very far ahead. Okay, let's 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 look at let's look at let's retrospectively look at the time left. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we are this week, twentieth January twenty eight for next year is Chinese New Year, meaning that okay. Um, <clears throat> It's a twenty twenty eighth. It's a twenty eighth. Uh, a public holiday. No right. In, in your workplace, do they give you like off day? But twenty seven is the MOM standard. So twenty eighth, we still have lesson, right? Okay. Uh, so the fourth. Okay, so. Test date is going to be on <clears throat> 20th of Feb. Right. 20th of Feb. So we will have already this period now. Okay, so test date 18th of um, 20th is your mobile application, Android. So ours will be on the 18th. So how much time have we left? Three, four weeks ah uh, from now. Okay. So typically most students will submit the CA two by around the test week. So if you need more time, you have approximately uh two weeks after. Because somewhere around then I need to submit the sub final grading for everything after the test. Okay, so the test itself will be a written test. Um, Nine minutes. 
So test will be 90 minutes long return. There's 10 minutes of reading time before that. Okay, so once you finish the test, you can go off already. As long as you finish. So by around, if you if the time left is around like 30 minutes left at the end of that, I think 15 minutes left at the end, you have to stay on throughout until the time finishes. So that's roughly the rule for the test. Now there's no bringing of cheat sheet, so other than your stationary and your student card, that's all you have on the table. Okay. Questions will be given to you, answers will be written into the question paper, answer boxes will be provided, spaces for you to fill answers. So in order to get ready for the test eventually, uh, you can refer to this REST API cheat sheet in the in the Pony more. So you should take a look at this one. And if you want to, there is also a mock test folder. Okay. You can actually look at this mock, download this mock test questions and try out. So the mock test question are similar to what you have you have in the actual test. This mock test is uh, very condensed. It's not the full. It, it will not take the full 90 minutes to finish. It's probably take like 15 minutes to finish up, yeah, at most. So it's a very fast, easy one. So use this to practice for yourself. The cheat sheet, is, cheat sheet will have um, things that's good to remember for the test. So it's kind of like just focus on certain things you must know there for the test. Okay. Um, so, so the next four weeks left, we will finish up all the implementation um, for your based on the topics, but mainly uh, what we can finish is related will be related to what CA2 is required for you to you for you to do. So in CA2, you these are the few the eight um, so called features. Okay. Update profile, send money, request money, view balance, get page transaction by date range, view transaction detail, add pay, remove pay. Okay, so some of this will seem to be a little bit repetitive uh, when you design the APIs, because normally you deal with the four operations: get, post, put, delete. Um, so here we'll probably have like a few posts, not just one. Okay. So working version of the project is required as long as these functions work. I know some of you have actually actually carried actually advanced to do finish up most of the features already. So based on the maybe the interview for the C2, because I actually seen your finished project like yours. So we'll map the functions we have accordingly across that. The only thing is very far from it. Okay. So as long as it's working and you demonstrated um, the ability to create those APIs. You're on a, a good track, I'll say. Okay, so well done for those who move ahead. Okay, the rest uh, who have not started, don't worry, you can start this week. <laughs> Some of the stuff. Now the latest code commit um, and on onwards for the next four weeks will start. We'll start to populate all these different functions in. Okay. So okay, so if we look at uh what the state of the last uh, code update what we have, so the last state of the code that we actually started with uh, some of the features like API versioning, okay, for the users, right? Yes. Oh, hold on. Different. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Let me see. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So which one is Wait, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Call me. <laughs> which one is easier? <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry. Come on, I never update. No, 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 no. Okay. So sorry, this. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Refer to the one online. Okay. Online is, what, oh, this is the correct one. Yeah.
This is easier. <laughs> okay. I forgot my I forgot that I should uploaded the latest one then. Okay, sorry, so sorry, huh? Uh first phase you've done is this too, right? You had a lot of restriction. Um and you some of you actually have done the authentication. Right? So there are three barrel custom key basic and either one is okay. So if you follow through what we've been doing the project in, in the code in the lab, right? What I show you. This will be one of the parts that feature that's done. Okay. Number two, as long as you have marked some of the resources to require authentication, like the roles allowed, the kind of annotation, right? And then it works, okay. Number two is satisfied already. You're frowning. Okay, so implementing resources that require authentication key to access. Example. This one. So some of your methods have you have put in this annotation. So this annotation based on what we how we do it using a filter request content request filter. This will prevent the API call from going through unless the postman or the client side provide the barrel token or token of some sort, right? So some of you have implemented the JWT. Some of you have implemented your token in the database. So as long as the mechanism is there to check, oh, a request comes in, it has this annotation, does it have a token, is it a GWT, or is it something in my database I check? You know, if it's valid, then I let it through, if it's not, I kick the person out. So as long as that kind of control system is there, then point number two here is um, done. So this is done, right? The next one, number three, get one user profile demonstrating the following. Okay, so for those who actually advance forward, okay, I seen some of you do custom key. Uh, you store a key in every way, so that works too. That works with me, and you already implemented the number two as well. Number three will be based on case by case basis. So recommended here is you should, you if you don't know what to do, you should create an endpoint to get one user profile, and within the, that you can actually implement content negotiation, videos, API versioning, and pagination. Okay. Now, pagination need not exist inside user profile if you've done it somewhere else already. Okay, as long as it's there. So those who have moved forward and done it somewhere else, I accept it. Content negotiation, okay, if you follow what we've done here in the code. Okay. So right now what we have is a get one user profile, which is this one, get one user. Okay. But it's not implemented in here yet. Notice that it only produces one type of uh, data, data format. But in the code sample, we actually implemented here inside the get all under transactions, right? So in order to pull this, make this work for the get profile, okay? We can I can show you later how that uh, how how that, that how that functions, right? So some some of this annotation can be set in and maybe start modifications to your object classes. So that's the content negotiation. For HDOS, basically what we mean is so the get user object needs to have links to um, features, which actually is present when we did the, the API versioning. So here, if you look at the API version, the V2 folder for users. So users model here actually returns uh, not just the JSON, but also links to the user transaction and context. Okay. So this, if you have implemented will also satisfy your assignment to the requirement for demonstrating use of implementation of videos. So this will be this. Now you also seen API versioning done, so you could demonstrate by, oh, here's a simple version of the get user, now here's the upgraded one using ATOS with V2. So that's API versioning. What I've not done so far here will be the pagination. So in pagination, places that or whether the function that can use pagination likely will be the transactions. Okay, so here somewhere we'll need to implement the pagination uh, links or the or the actually the query the query uh, strings that define the uh, next page page number and such. Okay. So that's what we're gonna work on. The last four um, so last four endpoints here transaction creation of transaction. If you follow the uh, the lab so far, we already have an add transaction method. Okay, 
so that is sort of covered. Update transaction status not not available in this current my current code build, so we can add this in later. Then uh, get transaction of user. Okay, so this is not in here yet. Okay, so we will run through that. Then finally, delete contact. Now delete contact will be under the so when we get the um, user object, let's say contact list. Now you notice that there's no contact resource here. So contact will be similar to what you some of you have implemented, like uh, the person, the name, like address book. So if you already have a function to remove the contact, then I think it's good enough. If you don't have, then you need to show, then you probably need to show me what's the equivalent of a delete operation. So if you look at what we have so far, um, uniquely speaking, you have a particular, this was a particular get one item request. This will be a post. Okay. If you've done post already, register. This will be a put. Okay. This will be another post, uh, another, another get, but it's a list. And finally, a DD operation. Uh, so at least there's one type operation among all the requirements. So if you do not have exactly based on this uh, type, then in the interview, right, just show me what you have equivalently for each. So if you didn't do a DD contact, it means a DD transaction, then that's good enough. You don't have an update transaction status, but you have an update profile. Okay, that's good enough also. So here is a guide for you. If you went ahead and build what you want, then just build what you want and then show me what's the so-called equivalent of these features. So if you have absolutely no idea of how to do it, how, what to do, you can follow this. But if you have a strong idea of what you're going to make, then just follow your idea and make it. I will mark case by case, make case by case basis. As long as you justify what, what makes sense for your app. Okay, so first order of the business today is to implement pagination uh, for the so inside get user profile we're gonna have pagination but how exactly are we gonna have pagination? Okay, the pagination actually be useful uh, for either either one of these two endpoints, which is transaction or context. So for the sake of demonstration, I'll use the transactions instead. So if you get a user transaction transaction object which is the our transaction resource here there's a get all so this get all is supposed to return you transactions but we need to return based on the user's uh, id right and we need to so to implement pagination we need to allow the client to send uh, other parameters using the query string so if i were to like write a bit of a comment here how this might look like okay so How your Android application or your client application or Postman as a demo will do it would be to say get transactions, right? And so for this is in the transaction object. So I didn't, I didn't put any user in front. I, say, I just say for transaction, what does it mean? Okay. So page will be some kind of a page index, right? Or some kind of page not ID. And maybe page size. So two parameters that this will read will require in a query string in order for it to fetch uh, a particular page or transactions. Some of you may have uh, also highlighted that if a user doesn't have a, a lot of transactions, um, this isn't very useful. True. So this is pagination is only useful when the data has a lot of it, or data has a lot of information, or rather if the list form of data has a lot of uh, data, the a lot of rows or elements inside. So as long as you have that kind of um, scale information, then you should implement pagination. So here I'm going to start off by relooking at the transaction model. So the transaction model was a class that I created um, to actually house the list of transactions that are paged. Now in Eclipse, you can actually, if you declare a instance of a class, you can actually go to the definition right by right clicking on the class name and click this option, open declaration, or press F3. So if, after a while, if your project has a lot of files, it's better to find what you want. You can take this shortcut to jump to your class decoration. Okay. So here is my current transaction model. Um, so what it contains is this is this apparently looks like a transaction model for one transaction. Okay. So but what I want to have is inside this get all is to return me a list. Okay. So this is not good enough. So I'm going to remove this for the time being. Now go to my models. So inside my models, 
I want to have a, a container for all my transaction with some kind of pagination. So some kind of pagination means that the response, um, basically the response data in JSON, right, probably will look a bit like this. So maybe we call it data or call it list, and it will be a JSON array. Okay, then there'll be a next. Okay, so next will be a link to. Something like that. Okay. So this will be the kind of uh, JSON response or the kind of object how it's going to look like. So I'll have a Java class that will have this structure. Data to carry the list, which is an array list of the transactions model I have, plus a next, which is a URL to the next endpoint for get fetching next page. So this list, next, next will terminate or rather you will know it's the end of the, end of the list or there are no more things to fetch when it's an empty string okay, so that, that's a condition I want to uh, design so first of all I need to go to my models and create uh, some kind of a class so uh, maybe I'll call this get transaction paged model so similar to what I have like um, written in, the, in here Okay. I will have two class attributes or properties, one data and one called next. So for the data, it will be simply an array list which will contain transaction, you get transaction model classes, classes here, called data. And then followed by the next. So the next basically is just a URL for the next page. So also, if you have like a list or another object in your class, you should try to create a constructor. Okay. This is just to initialize the, the properties in the class. So this is the class of properties very straightforward. Now go back to transactions. So ideally what I'm going to return is to do this get transactions page model. And TI list, I will return it into the response. So here will be my transaction manager class. Okay. Returns the get transactions page model. Okay. So I will expect the transaction manager return this structure. Right. Um, basically based on the user ID data. So let me go to my services under transaction manager. So here I have an add. I'm gonna add, add method. I'm gonna create one more method called get get by user or get by so get by user here. So what I'll need is a user ID. Okay. And this will definitely use this. Okay. So in the start of the method, you need to create this uh, this and then they, they return it. Oh, sorry. So it shouldn't be void, but it should be this type. Okay. So in order to return the transactions for a user based on user ID, okay, we're gonna look for basically any transaction with recipient ID equal to user ID or sender ID equal to user ID. Yeah. So that's a that's a query that we need to run. So of course, uh, at the beginning you need to do the basic try and catch. Okay. 
and also create a prepared statement. So in the prepared statement, um, we'll do a select star from here will be the table called transactions where so the column I'll be to match will be recipient ID and sender ID. So this is the basic SQL uh, query to retrieve transaction where either is the either the transaction is create is a money sent from the user or money received to from, of this user. So we haven't actually included the pagination controls here. Okay. So if you just run this statement, you will return you everything. Now to include the pagination controls, okay. Of course, the parameter here we need to include two more parameters that we will obtain from the query string. So let me come back to here. So in this model here, okay, I should carry out this. Um, okay, no, you should just take away, take away this one. So what happens is this is gonna take from the TX manager okay, by user, right, and user ID. So where does the user ID come from? Okay. <clears throat> so in this method, what we're going to do is I'm going to include uh, user ID as well as page and page size. So this method get all is going to is going to expect three different parameters. Um, and we're going to have the annotations here. So for user ID, okay, I'm going to set it up as a half parameter first. Then for the page, because I'm using query strings, then it will be a query parameter. And for page size, also a query parameter. Uh, at this point, you might be questioning if I have user ID as a path parameter, why can't I see it in the path here? Okay, so later I'll show you what's going on. Okay, so the intention for transaction right is this: the actual URL because I'm going to call it from user. Okay, this is the actual URL that this in this endpoint will be invoked. Evoke, uh, so imagine your postman or a client application wants to get the current user transactions because you have the current user login, right? So you will naturally want to say users based on the user ID and because transaction is a sub is a sub item of users, then you slash transactions like a subfolder followed by the page and page size. So somewhere later we will actually embed this class transaction inside the user uh, resource. In order to make this uh, format work, okay. of course, if you if you didn't know if you didn't know you can do that, what some what some people might have done is to actually go to users and then create a method to get transaction by user, right? And then they write the path inside that. Okay. That still works. But what I'm trying to do what I'm trying to do here is when we strictly say all transaction needs to be in the transaction resource because we have separate the different concerns. So one method of programming or simply one principle is separation concern. Separation concern meaning a particular class that does one job should do that one job and shouldn't mix with other things that the other class is doing. So this is one of the principles in coding that you don't try to put everything in the one uh, umbrella. Okay, as much as you can, you separate them. Okay, so this is the so right now I already have a transaction TX get by user user ID. Okay, so although this method is, or this request method is I'm going to accept two more parameters, I've not put them in yet, which is page and page size. Now I'll come back to the transaction manager class. Okay, so inside this method get by user ID, I need to include the page and page size. Um, so where will those page and page size be um, embedded in the SQL command? 
So in, remember we have this in MySQL's possibility to do a paging retrieval. You use the keyword called limit. The limit will have actually two parameters. Uh, there's another version called limit and offset. Okay. So limit will actually say what's the beginning and what's the take how many take how many uh, records. So the first one is the offset. The first is basically where do we start the row number, and the next parameter here is for the page size. So maybe before I get into that, okay, I'm gonna calculate uh, the offset. Okay, so the offset will be page. Jeremy page page size. This is uh, start from zero. So if you're at page 0, then you should go to page size, you should start at offset 0. If you're at page 1, if your page size is 10, then you start fetching at 10. Okay, so that's one. And next thing is, now is to fill in all the blank, all the question marks. Okay, every question mark needs to have the set integer. In this case, set integer to fill in the, the values. The next step after setting all the parameters, so one, position one and two will be for the user ID. This is for this and this. Position three and four will be the offset and the page size. Okay. So next thing will be to retrieve the result set from this uh, query. So here to TX list, under TX list, let's look at the TX list again. It has this attribute called data. Data is the one where we're going to add a new transition model inside. Okay. So here we'll do a, in order to iterate through the result from the result set, you need to use a loop. So while rs.next, so that next will tell you whether it, there are actually more records inside the result set. So here I will create a new transaction. So from here, uh, because I'm going to hide be uh, so we do this uh, quite hydration. So hydrating the object with the actual data from the database. So you just going to match the column based on what you have the model over. So let's see this recipient. Once you have one object done for transaction model, then I can uh, add use the add method to add it to the TX list data.
So all the TX list, the next step is to define to actually decide is there gonna be a next or not here. Okay. <clears throat> so the next here, the next here actually dep depends on the number of records that are available in the database. So in order to get a next, you need to find out how many records are there and if your offset is exceeding that number of records. So here you actually need another before I get to this part, you need another SQL query to count the number of records or number of transactions based on this condition. Receiving ID equals to the user ID or send ID to a user ID. Right. So one way to do this is to create another prepare statement within this um, try and catch and then return it uh, within there and you evaluate. Another method is to write another method outside. Okay, count transaction, count by user ID, right? Count by user. So, so I create as a separate method outside so that I can get the value at this point here, and then use it later on. <coughs> so return me integer. Yeah. Because, because this is going to be another SQL operation, your normal try and catch, and I can reuse this. Almost reuse this. Yeah. So connection prepare statement. Now the prepare statement here is different because I don't need to set the I don't need to retrieve the limit. Okay. I also don't need to retrieve the actual data. So if you're going to do a count. In SQL, there's this aggregate function called, or this function called count. So we call it aggregate function because other than the count, you can also do some average, uh, mean, or max. So depending on the database system, they may give you more advanced aggregate functions to use. So the count here can be what you can be decide what you want to count here. Most time count, you just put a star, or actually it doesn't matter doesn't matter much between a star and a column. Okay. If you're doing a sum aggregate, then you need to uh, pass into the function the column name that you want to like uh, do a aggregation function on. So in this case, because I don't want to retrieve retrieve data, I want you want to count the number of rows that belong to the user. I just do a count star. Okay. So when you are doing a count star from transaction, um, some some places will you call this a scalar function. The scalar function means you only return one value. So in some database uh, libraries, they actually have a special execute scalar, which is just to give you that one value. Um, you can also still use a result set uh, that still works. Let me just try and see if I can get that. So okay, so before I do the try, normally I would initialize the count uh, value and return at the beginning. And outside of the catch, I will return the value. So inside the try, then I will set the value, assign the value the, the, the number. So if let's say they have a scalar function, if they don't have, it's fine. You can still use the result set. Hold on, this is interesting get fetch size. What is this? Oh, okay, that's different. Okay, so I can't get, uh, don't see a scalar result, so never mind. I'll just use the result set. So if you want to use a result set, uh, you can still run SQL query, and because this will always have a value, so result set will always have one data. So it's like a table with one column, one row. So how do you get the value? Is that I need to say I need to call rs dot next. So I move the result set pointer to the value, and then I return it by saying count equal rs get. Yeah. Uh, here in this case, column index, um, because it's a one column result set, you can simply put a zero there. Yeah. There's no column name by the way when you do this. 
So count star if I say I were to do this uh, in the SQL in MySQL, I'll show you what it means. So if I were to like just count where recipient is zero, zero, okay, this is what happens. So in MySQL, the way the way this visualizes as a result set or table is actually really a one column, one row value here. Now you notice that column header here is called count star. Okay. So it takes, if you don't specify uh, what's the convenient header to use, it will just take the, the keyword here. Okay. If you want to specify a very nicer looking header, you can say as, you can use the S word, keyword. So S is like giving the value an alias, or sometimes you can actually use that use to name uh, certain roles that retrieve from database. Number of. So notice when I actually use the S keyword and then followed by my own name, I actually change the alias or the header of the column, the result set. Now for the function, for the purpose of retrieving number of rows, this isn't actually very important. Uh, it's quite insignificant. We only use this S when, uh, mostly when we do table joins. Table joins especially when you have the same name for the two tables, same column names. So something you want to differentiate, you try to, you can actually rename it within the column on the fly. Okay. But in your case, when you're doing this assignment, there won't be a need to join table. There shouldn't be much on your join tables. So, and I don't think likely you have tables with the same column names. So this is good enough. Okay. So this will get initial return, return me the count value, uh, store an account and return it. So I'm going to call this method inside here. Count. Uh, then you say count my user and pass user ID. Okay. So I'm going to use this to decide whether the offset uh, exceeds this. Okay, because offset is going to be determined by the page number that's passed in here in the um, parameter of the method. So for next to be there, okay. So initially, in, initially I was initialized uh, set set the value to next to an empty string. Then I'll say if this uh, rather set is greater than this total number of columns you have available, then oh sorry, it should be lesser. Okay, and test next would be equal to. Users plus user ID plus So what I'm doing here is I'm actually constructing the URL for the next the next uh, URL to get next page. So here I will say I'll need to supply a next page plus page size equals to size. Missing is missing variable is needs page. Uh, or actually rather it's page plus one. Okay, so I can actually replace this with page plus one. So current page, we get next page plus one, of course, and this is the page size that is provided in the method parameter. Append it to this uh, string to give you to give that give back the endpoint that's of the uh, next uh, URL. Maybe you can take away this. <clears throat> okay, so this is it. Now, if your offset is more than the available or equals to the total, total count or records, right, then this the next will actually remain as the empty string. So now we come back to the method. Uh, okay, so missing here in the method since we added. The page image size will be this two other outstanding parameters to send in. Okay, so more or less this is how this one to work. Okay, so now let me start. So
Any questions so far? So I'm going to change to, oh yeah, what's happening now is, that's right. Oh yeah, I uh, forgot to say one thing. <coughs> um, one more step to go. If I try to call this method, trans get transactions, <coughs> okay. what is going to happen is you'll complain that you can't get this path parameter inside. Okay. Okay. So sorry, one more step to go. Okay, so uh, next step is actually to embed this in the user resource or rather the v2 or the user resource so in my user resource here i have a method for okay create get one right okay. so First thing, how so now how do I make transactions part of users? Okay, without copying the code over. <clears> hmm. <throat> <clears throat> So the idea is if users class is accessible by the path users and I want transactions to be accessible inside users. Okay. And I what I, what I do is I create a public instance of transactions from this transaction is actually from the resources inside the users class. And so here, so there must be some way for me to pull this one out, right? I think I forgot a bit of uh, stuff. Uh, quite sub resourcing. Hmm, <coughs> sub resources. Sub resources is uh, oh no. No. <clears throat> ah, okay. User is here, get post put. To go to the sub resources. Okay, so here is example. Okay. Printers, printers, list, get me sources, get table. Uh, okay. So Here, so doing this half oh, no. 
sorry. Puff. <clears throat> okay. Yep. This one. The new transactions. Okay, so we should be like this. Okay. <clears throat> What's going on? Yeah. Um, hey. So, um, normally in your source class, you have a method that is a public response. Okay, so response means returns a HTTP response, like this create user. Okay, or this get one. So this this method is meant to entertain a, a, a HTTP request that comes in. So if the end the client will say or oh, user slash a certain ID it provides, okay, Java would map that eventually to this method here. Okay, so every method here is somewhat entertaining a request, has entertaining a request somewhere, based on the path structure and the HTTP method. On the top, what I've done is I added one more. Um, I added a method in a resource, but doesn't return a response. Okay, so this here returns me the entire transaction resource. Different, huh? So normally you have a public response. Okay, this is fine for the methods inside. Vincent that class. Uh. Oh he's um uh, he's um media set media room right at the other block. Okay, quickly. So get transaction here is a method that doesn't return a response, it returns a resource. Okay. The reason why I return a resource is because the way I want it to I want the request to travel here is this is specifically user ID slash transaction. So it means which means we might Endpoint my or my client is gonna call user slash certain ID slash transaction. You will come to this particular method, and the method here we're gonna take the user ID. Then pass into the transaction resource uh, class. Now, right now, my transaction resource class doesn't have a constructor with user ID yet. Okay, so I'm gonna go there and make one. So I'll put user ID. So I'm going to have a private, in the private, uh, private, uh, private property called user ID, and I'll add one more constructor for this. So if this transaction was to be instantiated with a user ID, the method get all, if I want to get all by user, Okay, I 
you can take away I can take away this user ID in the get all method. So should I have user ID here? The user ID here will refer to this resource on private user ID. <coughs> okay, so what happens is when your client call slash users, given ID slash transactions, page, whatever. So first of all, Java would identify by the path that it's gonna that that's this request is going to come to a user's resource first. Okay, because you start with users. Now your path also have slash transactions, then you match to this method. Okay. When you mention this method, okay, this method doesn't return a response but returns a transaction resource. So you will, so this method return me a transaction resource based on the user ID. Then you will come to here, this transaction class. Now because previously I'm in users and I'm given a user ID, it will instance the class with a user ID and store inside private user, private integer user ID. And because I'm calling this transactions, okay, so you pass the request to the transaction class and then try to match which of this method to your request coming in. So if your request coming in is a get in this case, okay, then look for the matching get methods. So if the request coming in is transactions, user slash ID slash transactions, so the transaction here already is the class. Uh, I match the class path. So after transaction, what do you have? If there's nothing, then you come to this particular method because there's no other method here that is a get method. Then you will look at your query parameter for page and page size and then pass it into the service manager class get by user. So this is how your request from client will travel into one resource and then go to a sub resource. Any questions? How sub resourcing works? Fifteen minutes break. Fast. Okay, call. Cool.